There is a rape culture on American college campuses. Data don't lie. Four out of 1,000 college women every year are raped or sexually assaulted. 8.5% of college women experience forcible rape while in college. Definitions of sexual assault and forced sex are being hopelessly muddied by sexual assault education on campuses. Relations between women and men are adversarial. There is a battle of the sexes, a war between the sexes. There is, at this moment, a sort of culture for um, young women, in many cases, of encouraging them to see rape in incidents that, you know, maybe should be seen as poor decision making. That we're having a debate like this at all is evidence that I think we live in a rape culture. Imagine if 20% of all Jewish students on college campuses had swastikas painted on their, on their drunken bodies during drunken parties. How would people feel if, for instance, somebody decided to put signs on mirrors in a Muslim center on campus saying you're looking at somebody who can stop terrorism? Welcome to this seventh debate, seventh debate, of the second season of the Soul Forum, both to those in our physical audience at the Subculture Theater in downtown Manhattan and to the thousands around the globe who are watching us on live streaming. Uh, the, uh, we are a monthly debate series that features topics of special interest to libertarians and aims to enhance social and professional ties within New York City's libertarian community. This is an Oxford-style debate in which the audience initially votes for, against, or undecided on the resolution, and then again after the debate is over. Whoever moves the vote in his or her favor is declared the winner. Go into SohoVote.com to cast your initial vote. You'll find that tonight's resolution reads, there is a rape culture on college campuses that creates an unsafe environment for female students. Kate DeCherbo, would you please come to the stage and give people a briefing about the voting. Kate? Sure. OK, so. So in order to vote, you go to uh, Soho Forum, I mean, uh, SohoVote.com. And if you haven't been able to log in yet, you'll notice that around the room, we have um, some posters. And then I'll explain to you uh, how to get onto the Wi-Fi. So again, that's SohoVote.com, and um, you just you know you, you indicate your vote. Once the vote begins, I mean, once the debate begins, we're going to close voting, and, and we'll let you know at that point. And then you'll be asked to vote again at the end of the debate. All right. Why you are considering uh, your vote? Uh, bear in mind that we are partnered with Reason Magazine in, in presenting these debates, and you can catch audio of all our events on the Reason podcast, which you'll find in the iTunes store. You'll also be able to catch a video. Thanks also to the Smith Family Foundation for making this series possible. For more information and to buy tickets to our future debates, go to our website at thesoulforum.org. I'm Gene Epstein, director of the Soul Forum. With every Soul Forum, we have a warm-up act. And this evening, we are pleased to bring back the great comic, Dave Smith. Dave's podcast, Part of the Problem, has an enormous following, which certainly includes me, and not just because I've been honored to be a guest on Dave's show. The show's title, Part of the Problem, is derived from that famous line, I assume, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Dave, please come on stage and tell us how to be part of the solution. Dave Smith. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. How are we? How about a round for Gene, huh? Gene Epstein puts together this wonderful uh, series. You know, when Gene first asked me if I wanted to tell some jokes before a debate about rape, I, uh, I thought to myself, yeah, it's every comic stream. Of course. Why would I not jump at that opportunity? And I understand that there's libertarians here. We have one of our debaters is leans to the left, I would imagine. But, you know... We might disagree on the subject, but when it comes to the topic of sexual assault, I can always count on the left to have a good sense of humor. So I appreciate that <laughs> jokes are always allowed. I, it's very, listen, it's very, uh, sure. Is there a problem with sexual assault in the country? I'm sure there is. But I know like all of you, 
we can count on Donald Trump to get to the bottom of it. <laughs> so I'm sure whatever this problem is will soon be resolved. All right, sorry. I don't wanna... <laughs> Listen, I'm not part of the problem on this issue, okay? Gene, I, I'm engaged now. My fiance is here. Uh, so yeah, thank you, women in the audience, for applauding. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I got out of the game in perfect time. As soon as the Me Too moment started, I was like, I'm settling down. This is not, I can't navigate these waters. I can't, it's too much. I feel bad for some of these young guys. I don't even know how you go about dating these days, you know? You go up to a woman, you're like, can I buy you a drink? And she's like, actually, I'm gonna call the cops. And you're like, all right, well, I guess that I'll count that as a lesson learned in this. I, for the record, I was a supporter of the Me Too movement until they started ruining comedians, and then I was like, too far, okay, too far. <laughs> Stick to Hollywood, and I'll be with you. You take out all those leftists in Hollywood, I'll cheer this thing on. Then you're like, Louis C.K., I'm like, all right, let's, let's reel it in a little bit, I don't. Louis C.K., he got ruined because he was, he was masturbating in front of women. I think he's the only guy to ever get ruined for sexually assaulting himself, as far as I... But I'm no historian, so I can't tell you the... <laughs> and then Aziz Ansari, he went down, and I don't know if you read the story on babe.com, which we all go to every morning, um, but... <laughs> the story with Aziz was, um, he went out with a woman, they got some drinks, they, they went back to his place, they got naked, they both performed oral sex on each other, and then he tried to have intercourse with her. Now, in my day, we called that a date, but evidently, <laughs> it's a whole different time that we're living in now, I don't know. The weird thing is that I always thought Louis C.K. was like an amazing, brilliant comedian, and then when that stuff came out, it's like, oh, Louis. I, I always thought Aziz kind of stunk and then when that stuff came out, I was like, go as ease, you know? Like, wait, <laughs> the three people just laughed are my favorite in the crowd, by the way. This is, I size up the crowd. It's a tough time. I don't know what to say. I don't, this is why I settled down. I'm, I'm very happy with my fiance. I'm never gonna be a part of a hashtag. That's what I know, deep in my heart. I always hate, by the way, that's what I recommend to young guys who are out there. Just settle down. You don't have to have these problems. Just don't go out and even risk anything. Just find a, g a great woman and be good to her, you know? Sorry, I was just trying to win points after those questionable <laughs> rape jokes, but I just... I always hate, I hate when men like bitch about their wife or their girlfriend, I hate that. You know, as men like, ugh, the ball and chain. And it's like, it's a voluntary relationship. You know, if you hate it that much, leave. It's like if you were in a prison and then they were like, uh, we're gonna get rid of the cells and also there's no more guards and the door, the front door's wide open. And then you were just sitting there and you're like, man, jail sucks. <laughs> it's like, well, I have a solution. Take a walk. Like, what, what are we doing here? I do. I love these events, Gene, I always do. Especially now that Reason Magazine is a part of this, it's unbelievable. Yeah, we get all 70 libertarians in New York in one room together. It's an amazing, it's an amazing moment. Yeah. The world is fun these days. No matter what you think, I don't know, libertarians are split. Some of you guys love Trump, some of you guys hate Trump, but you all have to admit, it is entertaining as shit. Like, there is no... It is fun. I turn on the news every day just to make sure Trump's still president. I don't even know. You just gotta turn it on for like five minutes. You're like, all right, we're still doing this. Let's keep moving with it. That's... <laughs> right? Don't you always think? Like, they, a lot of people think he's gonna get impeached. I don't know. So, you know. I don't know, maybe he'll get impeached. I couldn't tell you for sure. But I don't think anyone's gonna beat Trump in an election. I don't think they can. You gotta debate that guy and no one can out debate Trump. Trump found a whole new way to debate, you know? You remember when Hillary Clinton was trying to debate Trump? Oh man, she just couldn't handle it. She was up there being a traditional politician and she would say traditional politician-y things like Hillary Clinton would be like, you know, the rhetoric Donald Trump uses is just reckless. And then Trump would be like, 
your husband's a rapist. And like, <laughs> Hillary's like, Jesus, like what? And they're like, Hillary second, hey, Hillary, you have 30 seconds to respond if you'd like to. And she's like, what? My husband's a rapist? I didn't have anything prepared for that. Like, um, I've asked him to stop? I don't know, like what? And she's like, he's not gonna. He's not gonna stop. And I'll wrap up on that, but that was the one, you know, for everything Donald Trump may have said on a tape. I grew up, I'm a 90s kid. Bill Clinton was our president, you know? And that guy's got a track record just shy of Bill Cosby. Like, he's, how come he never gets in trouble for it? Yeah. On a scale of one to Cosby, Bill Clinton is like an eight. Which is pretty bad. Don't look at me. I'm a zero, okay? I don't have none of that. Bill Clinton, you've seen him these days? Looks weird. Looks weird. Bill Clinton did it all wrong. He was like fat in the middle of his life and then got skinny in old age. Like that's not how it's supposed to go, all right? You're supposed to be in shape and then when you get older, you can let yourself go a little bit. Now I just gotta watch Bill Clinton plus the skin of old Bill Clinton walk around and it's, it's uncomfortable. Well, as far as opening for a debate on rape, this is about as good as I think I can do. So I do appreciate all you guys coming out. Enjoy uh, the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Thank you, Dave Smith. And uh, do listen uh, to his show, Part of the Problem. You can, see, you can hear some of the intellect, some of the insights underneath those jokes. Dave shares some pretty piercing insights on his show, Part of the Problem. Uh, well. Uh, arguing for the affirmative on the resolution, we have sociologist Michael Kimmel. Professor Kimmel, please come to the stage. <laughs> Opposing the resolution, we have journalist Kathy Young. Kathy, please come to the stage. Michael Kimmel, you have 10 minutes to defend the resolution. There is a rape culture on college campuses that creates an unsafe environment for female students. Kate, please close the voting. Take it away, Michael. Thank you. Two words, rape culture, okay? We're gonna take them one at a time. Pretty much every single study that involves statistically adequate sampling comes up with the same percentages. Here are just a few. National Institute of Justice, between one-fifth and one-fourth attempted or completed while in college. 90% know their assailants, more than half were by a person that the woman was dating. Less than 5% reported to the police. Three other large-scale surveys taken together come up with a rate of 8.5% of college women experience forcible rape while in college. When you add incapacitated or attempted rape, the rate jumps to between 14 and 26%. These do not include cases of unwanted touching, grabbing, fondling, or what we might call trumping, or even psychological coercion. Individual campus studies find similar rates. University of New Hampshire, one-third. Ole Miss, 27%. Michigan, 22.5% in the last 12 months. Perhaps the most methodologically rigorous study ever done on a college campus is being done right now at Columbia, based on surveys, participant observations, and interviews. Since entry, 22% of, uh, of students reported at least one incident of sexual assault. 28% women. 38% LGBT, and 12.5% men. More than 10% of men, maybe now some of the men in the room will believe me when I say there's a rape culture on college campuses. On aggregate, the best estimates are that between 10, 7 and 10% of women experience forcible rape while in college, and somewhere between 14 and 26% experience sexual assault. Does this add up to rape culture? Well, you tell me. If not, ask yourself what percentage might work for you. And it's true, there's been no nationally representative survey of all college students. We don't have the best data that we could have. Why? Because we live in a rape culture, a culture that actually doesn't want to know, doesn't want to believe women. Now, what's been the campus response to this? In 2014, the Senate uh, surveyed 440 colleges and universities, and they found less than 5% of rape victims report their attacks to law enforcement. 
Half of those institutions, only half, provide a hotline for victims. Two-fifths have not conducted a single investigation in the past five years. One-fifth give their athletics department oversight on sexual violence. So of course, what's been the response of the administration? To improve, to improve right? No, they decided simply to change the metrics. Frankly, that's how you know you live in a rape culture. To conclude this part, I know no serious credentialed social scientist who would argue with these rough percentages. I think it, I'm proving the rape part. Now let's turn to culture. What defines a culture is a set of values and ideas that underlie the norms that we create to govern and organize social life. Our culture defines morality, good and evil, appropriate, inappropriate behavior. So what are the cultural values, the ideas that govern relationships between the sexes? We can see it, I think, as anthropologists would tell us, in our language. Here are those values. One, relations between women and men are adversarial. There is a battle of the sexes, a war between the sexes. Two, it is an uneven battle. Oh, forget patriarchy. In the phenomenology of rape culture, women are the ones in power. Men are one down to women. Women's beauty, their sexuality, inflicts an injury on men. She's ravishing, stunning, a knockout, bombshell, dressed to kill, a femme fatale. Sex is a battle. And when, when a couple has sex, he wins and she loses. She puts out, she gives it up. He gets some, gets over on her, hits on her. He's a stud, she's a slut. Sex is then the violent restoration of the way things should be. We tap it, bang it, beat it, hit it, nail it, plow it, poke it, pound it, ram it. Finally, we win and restore the natural balance. We get even. In a letter to the New York Times denouncing sexual harassment guidelines, a college chaplain wrote that, and this is a quote, the way young women dress in the spring constitutes a sexual assault on every male within eyesight of them. Okay, so there is a rape culture, and women are perpetuating on men by how they dress. Just because there's a general rape culture, that does not mean that it's uniform across all campuses. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the variables that predict rape proneness or rape freedom um, after the anthropologist Peggy Reeves Sanday. What are the variables that predict this? What's the social ecology of rape culture? Where, when, let's map it. First, what kind of degree does the, does the school offer? I know this sounds weird, but community colleges have much lower rates, why? Because many of the structural features of sexual assault, a social life that revolves around campus residential life, party culture, weekend sports life, are missing. Second, who are the rapists? One in five college women experience some form of sexual assault, but it's only five to six percent of college men who are committing sexual assault, about six rapes over their college career. Many sexual assaults on campus are committed by serial predators. What does the serial predator need? Unlike the lone serial murder on criminal minds, the serial rapist needs motive, a sense of entitlement to women and an alarming contempt for them, opportunity, sexualized spaces, and one more thing, support, community, a culture of silence that he interprets as approval. Remember, this is not the old stereotypic rapist who jumps out of the bushes. He's the guy who eyes you seductively when you walk into a party, dances with you flirtatiously, and seems so solicitously chivalrous in making sure your drink is always refilled. He usually needs a place to be, a space that's sexualized, and a place to go, as in upstairs to his room, and a sense of brotherly support, the sense that he has approval, indeed admiration of his friends. That's a rape culture. Time also matters. There's the red zone, the first three months of college life, from first year orientation to Thanksgiving break, when about half of all assaults take place. This is not spread out over, e evenly over a woman's four years. Recent research found much higher rates of sexual assault among first year women than among second year. Now, it might simply be that higher rates among Greek, uh, uh, Greeks and um, athletes are because they tend to have the houses where you have parties. On all college campuses, that have, that have re regulated uh, Greek letter fraternities and sororities, sororities are prohibited by charter and by law from serving alcohol at parties. The fraternities are permitted to do so, subject to local alcohol rules, which everybody flaunts. That means that the guys have the parties. That the parties happen on guys' turf. They control the space, they control the drinks. And finally, there's the gender culture. The way that those assumptions about the battle of the sexes inform how young people interact with each other. 
Every year since the mid-1980s, UCLA psychologist Neil Malamuth has surveyed male students, quote, attraction to sexual aggression, unquote. Their interest in and willingness to engage in acts of sexual aggression. In his research, between 16 and 20% of the male respondents said they would, quote, commit rape, unquote, if they could be certain of getting away with it. When Malamuth changed the word commit rape to, quote, force a woman to have sex, unquote, between 36 and 44% of the men said they would, as long as they would be certain they wouldn't get caught. Most recent data, 2017, 32%. So rape culture is not about the prevalence of rape. It's the remarkable prevalence of not reporting, of not believing women, uh, um, or believing you won't be believed. Pretty much everyone acknowledges that sexual assaults on campus are dramatically underreported. So we can only get a glimpse of how pervasive it is. It is possible that women, as well as men, are likely to misperceive what would legally qualify as rape or attempted rape as a date gone bad. In fact, according to, uh, according to one survey, um, it, uh, less than half of the women who had experienced something that fits the legal definition of rape actually described what happened to them as rape. Now, you'd have to engage in some pretty strange epistemology to conclude that if they don't define it as rape, it wasn't rape. Crimes do not depend on victim confirmation. But, in a rape cult, but, but that's a rape culture, a culture in which what is legally defined as rape is explained as normal, as dating etiquette. Now, remember this most important fact. Most men do not make this choice. Most men do not commit sexual assault. 75% of college women are not assaulted. Even if all the, the men in the survey by Malamuth, who said they would force a girl to have sex, even if she didn't want to, because they knew they could get away with it, actually did it, it would still be, quote, only, unquote, half of them. Can there be a rape culture in which the overwhelming majority of men do not rape? Of course. Rape is excused or exonerated and unnoticed, and still men don't rape. A third of men said they would force a woman to have sex if they knew it, and still one third of men don't commit rape. So here's, here's what, how I will conclude. The truth is, we shouldn't even be having this debate. That we're having a debate like this at all is evidence that I think we live in a rape culture. Imagine if 20% of all Jewish students on college campuses had swastikas painted on their, on their drunken bodies during drunken parties. Or if 20% of African American students had nooses draped around their necks at an equally drunken party. Why is the astonishingly high rates of, of assaults of women and LGBT people tolerated? Not because it's wrong. Of course it is. Because we live in a rape culture. There is a rape culture on American college campuses. Data don't lie. The good news is that despite these cultural assumptions, these values, and the overwhelming likelihood of exoneration, most men are better than the culture they live in. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, was, it about, was it about one minute over, Rudolph? One minute, yeah, so uh, uh, you took 11 minutes, that's fine. Uh, well, uh, you needed to get it in, that's okay. Uh, Kathy, you have 11 minutes. Uh, Rudolph, give Kathy 11 minutes to uh, speak for the negative. Take it away, Kathy. Okay. Thank you. So when we uh, talk about the idea of a rape culture on campus, uh, we're not talking simply about surveys, studies, and theoretical analysis. We're talking about real cases that involve real people. And here's one of them that unfolded uh, this month at Yale University. A student named Saifula Khan went on trial on charges of sexually assaulting a female classmate. This was a rare campus case in which the criminal justice system actually got involved. The, the young woman said that Khan returned with her to their dorm after a Halloween party and a concert uh, when she was so intoxicated that she was half conscious, barely walking, and repeatedly vomiting. While she said she had only a vague recollection of what happened later, she felt certain that he had forced himself on her when she was in no state to say yes or no. Khan, on the other hand, said that they had consensual sex, which was initiated by the young woman, that she was an active participant throughout, and became upset about it the next day. Khan was acquitted, and this outcome was met with uh, great anger from anti-rape activists and feminist commentators, especially because of defense tactics that were decried as, quote, a survivor's worst nightmare. Above all, the fact that Khan's lawyer quizzed the young woman about her sexy Halloween costume to suggest that she was interested in sex with Khan. Many cited this as proof that campus sexual assault needs to be handled by college tribunals, 
rather than courts, since victims will not find justice in the male-oriented legal system. A columnist for the Yale Daily News argued that Khan, who was suspended from university more than two years ago when the charges against him were filed, should not be allowed to return, since uh, allowing him to return to campus would validate victim blaming. This is the kind of case that is very often invoked as uh, evidence of a rape culture. And yet, a closer look at this case by people who either attended the trial or interviewed jurors, including my recent colleague, Robbie Suave, showed an extremely different picture. Uh, Khan, it turns out, was not acquitted because the young woman was slut-shamed about her sexy costume, but because the evidence contradicted her story. Specifically, her claim of extreme intoxication was not supported either by witnesses or, crucially, by security camera footage of her and Khan walking to the dorm. Well, she said that it showed her being led by Khan with her eyes closed and one foot dragging, the jurors actually saw her walking with him, her arm around uh, his waist, his arm around her shoulder, a grin on her face. Uh, the jurors also heard that the young woman uh, actually spoke to somebody on the phone while Khan was uh, in her room and seemed entirely conscious. They heard that when she first went to the campus health center to ask for emergency contraception, she initially said she had had a consensual encounter. Uh, and later, after speaking to her friends, she apparently came to the conclusion that she had been uh, raped. Uh, one female alternate who was interviewed after the verdict insisted that not, uh, not only did the prosecution not prove guilt, but that the facts showed Khan was innocent. Uh, many advocates for survivors tell us we are complicit in a culture of rape if we give Khan the benefit of the doubt. I would say that if we do not give Khan the benefit of the doubt, we are complicit in a culture of injustice. Uh, one may ask if this case was an outlier, and yet a remarkable percentage of the cases we hear about as evidence of a campus rape culture involve intoxication, usually on both sides, and foggy memories, also often on both sides. Now, of course, intoxication is not an excuse for rape. Being drunk doesn't excuse raping somebody. Uh, the fact that a woman is drunk doesn't excuse raping her. But typically, in these cases, the claim of rape or sexual assault rests solely on intoxication. The person, usually the woman, occasionally the man, being too drunk to consent. Certainly this has been true in a lot, possibly most, of the cases we have seen in which male students expelled from college after being found responsible for sexual misconduct have sued for wrongful expulsion. Um, here's another case, uh, this one at Ohio University in Athens, Ohio in October 2013. Two students who had just left the bar late at night engaged in a drunken public sex act, specifically the man performing oral sex on the woman, that drew a small crowd of spectators and of course was caught on camera. The next day, photos and the video went, went viral on the internet and the female student, suddenly aware of all this stuff going around, uh, went to the police saying that she had no memory of any of this and that she had been sexually assaulted. The male student was charged. This was a rare case. Usually in those cases, of course, everything happens behind closed doors. Here we actually had not only eyewitness testimony, but actual video of the sexual activity. And both of those confirmed that the woman was fully conscious, or certainly appeared to be, quite willing and even enthusiastic. At one point, apparently encouraging the man to continue when he saw the crowd of onlookers and said, well, maybe we should stop. She also walked away with him unassisted, and in view of all these facts, the grand jury brought no indictment. Uh, what happened next was that the campus activists rallied against uh, the, the, this decision and to the woman's side. This incident was invoked as evidence of a campus rape culture, of glamorization of sexual violence, I'm using some of the quotes that came from the activists, survivor blaming, and refusal to take rape accusations seriously. Uh, Tara Culp Ressler, a blogger for Think Progress, uh, defended the sexual assault charge against the man, noting that witnesses said both of the participants were severely intoxicated. Now, of course, the operative word here is both. There is a glaring double standard here. Imagine a gender reverse situation in which a woman was giving oral sex to a man in public and they were both very drunk. It's entirely possible that this too would have been perceived as sexual assault, but certainly not in a man. There have been many studies, which uh, Michael referenced, over the past 30 years, dealing with the subject of campus sexual assault and its prevalence. Uh, and in fact, there have been, uh, contrary to what Michael says, many polemics about the methodology of these studies and what they mean. Yes, they all sort of come to the same result because they all use somewhat similar methodology. 
Uh, now, um, does it matter that most of the women who are classified as victims in many of these surveys don't think they were raped, even in today's environment where there's extensive education about sexual assault? I would say that it does. Do, do these surveys measure rape or sexual assault or awkward sexual encounters and miscommunication? Does it matter, for instance, that the, 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 there is a, a very reputable survey which shows a very different result? That's the National Crime Victimization Survey uh, conducted by the Justice Department, which asks people about sexual violence in the context of criminal victimization, as opposed to in the context of sexual activity. And that survey finds that about four out of 1,000 college women every year are raped or sexually assaulted, which certainly doesn't add up to anything close to one in four or one in five over the course of one's uh, college career. It should be noted, by the way, that the National Crime Victimization Survey specifically asks people about being assaulted by someone you know. Uh, so it's not about people thinking that acquaintance rape is not real rape. Um, I should also add, by the way, that sexual assault is often defined very broadly. It's defined uh, sometimes broadly enough to include unwanted kissing. So I, I, I think that some caution is definitely in order when we talk about some of these studies. I will also say one thing. I think that it will soon be impossible, and it's probably becoming impossible already, to conduct a reliable study of rape or sexual assault on campus because the definitions of sexual assault and forced sex are being hopelessly muddied by sexual assault education on campuses. Uh, young people, for instance, are routinely taught that all sex while intoxicated is sexual assault, which is not the law. Uh, you have to be incapacitated, not simply intoxicated. Uh, they're taught that any unwanted sex is sexual assault, even if you never signal your unwillingness. And of course, by these definitions, a lot of men have been sexually assaulted by women. Uh, a, one large survey at the University of New Hampshire in 2005, in which students of both sexes were asked about these experiences, found that about 40% of those reporting sex when too drunk to consent were male. Now, if rape culture is, uh, as uh, Michael was saying, part of this uh, gender system in which men are seen as dominant over women, it really doesn't make sense that we have so many uh, you know, putative male victims. Uh, by the way, we also have some college uh, officials explicitly advocating a double standard. Several years ago, a, a, a Duke University dean explicitly said when testifying in a case of uh, a male student suing the school that when both parties are drunk, when it's a male and a female, quote, it is the responsibility of the male to gain consent before proceeding with sex. Now, at one point, the feminist critique of how society treated rape and sexual assault had a lot of valid points. Feminists correctly pointed out that women who were sexually assaulted were often expected to put up a serious physical resistance to prove non-consent. This was not expected of victims of other crimes. This was discriminatory. Today, we seem to have gotten to the point where we say that when a man and a woman are in the same situation, we will hold only the man responsible. That is not equality. Uh, I think we can certainly argue that drunken sex, where you, you barely remember the, uh, the details the next day, is not healthy behavior. We can educate young people about it, I think, without creating a dichotomy of victim and perpetrator, and certainly without assuming victimhood by gender. Uh, of course, sexual violence happens. Uh, according to the National Crime Victimization Survey, uh, it happens on campus less often than it does among non-college people in the same age group. But certainly, colleges have a legitimate interest in preventing sexual violence. I think we can do that without conflating rape with irresponsible sex, without creating double standards, and in many cases, demonizing men while patronizing women. And I think we can do it without creating a paradigm of rape culture that is hostile to the open discussion and debate about sexual assault. Uh, I, I think we should be able to have conversations like these without being told that they contribute to rape culture. And I think uh, we can do it also without um, uh, creating a definition of rape culture that is hostile to the presumption of innocence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Michael, uh, five minutes of rebuttal. Uh, you can check the podium. You can do it okay. Sure. Um, I, I'm sorry that I operate from a distinct disadvantage. I'm a social scientist, so I don't argue from anecdote. I argue from evidence. <laughs> sorry. As a result, I have to say these surveys do not use similar methods. Uh, they, they use uh, they do not use similar methods. In fact, the one survey that Kathy. Re re 
uh, used, the National Crime Victimization Survey, is the one that is least used to talk about campus sexual assault for many reasons. One, um, one of these is it's because it's a national crime victimization survey, and people know that that's it, so they're already much more likely to it may inhibit their reporting. Second, the national crime victimization survey does not ensure privacy. Third, it does not ask about incapacitated rape. It asks about rape, attempted rape, or other forms of sexual attack. All of the other surveys, the public health surveys, the criminal justice methodologies undertaken by all of the other surveys, including those by Bonnie Fisher at the National College Women's Sexual Victimization Survey, use very different methods, and they all come up with about the same percentages. But maybe we shouldn't be arguing about percentages, because maybe, percent, maybe I, I just haven't reached the threshold, only, only 25%. Maybe we can dismiss that. So let's talk about something else. Let's talk about why uh, about why women don't report. I don't think there's very much, uh, there's very much disagreement. Maybe there is. Um, about uh, very, very, very few uh, women report sexual assault. Um, according to one survey, 12.8%, um, uh, sorry, 5% uh, of, of women report sexual assault. Now, why would that be so low? Why would that be? Shame, self-blame, fear of reprisal, fear of being ostracized, reading articles by Kathy Young. But remember that nine out of 10 offenders are known to the victim, usually a classmate, a friend, or an acquaintance. 12% um, of completed rapes, 35% of attempted rapes, and 22.9% of threatened rapes take place on a date. Somewhere about half of those, uh, both perpetrator and victim, had been drinking. So is there hyperbole? Of course there is. Exaggerated, distorted claims, of course. There was not, Kathy offered several anecdotes about cases. We, but what we don't have is a full analysis of all of the cases that have been, of those 5% that have been fully adjudicated. That would be an interesting study. Any graduate students in the audience want to do a dissertation? Because that we do not have. We do know that, that over 90%, over 90% of those who have been assaulted don't report they, because they believe that they will not be believed. I think that is significant. And I think it also is significant when we get to the stage of adjudication, which is not the area um, that we're talking about now. I'm simply arguing about the presence of uh, rape culture. Uh, adjudication is a completely different matter. But it does matter to me that if I see somebody reporting to me and knowing that only 5% report, I suspect she has a pretty good case at the outset. I suspect she does precisely for that reason. So um, I have one suggestion for this, and I think this is something that Kathy and I would agree about. Here's, a, here's an idea. In universities, um, I've, been, I've spent my 40 years in, in colleges and universities, large public universities in California, New York, and New Jersey. And I have to tell you, over those 40 years, when we get students who are coming to college today who are unprepared for college at work, we have all kinds of remedial, um, uh, of remedial programs for them. We have required remedial writing programs. We have required remedial math programs. All of these because we recognize that they are ill-prepared for college life. So why don't we have mandatory, comprehensive sex education in our colleges? Because our students are coming to us with either no, comp no sex education, abstinence-based educa sex education, which is even worse than no sex education. They think that online pornography is their sex education. And you, I, I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you how that the average age of first seeing on online pornography is about seven. And by 14, 96% of boys have seen online pornography. They think that that's their sex education. So here's an, so here's an answer I think we probably would agree on. Man comprehensive sex education as a remedial tool to reduce the likelihood of sexual assault on campus because the students are coming ill-prepared for college, college life, which I, I argue is, includes a rape culture. Thank you. Uh, uh, five minutes of rebuttal. Kathy, you can check the podium. You can do it from there. Which one? You want to check the podium? Okay. Take it away, Kathy. All right. 
so first of all, I want to defend the NCVS, the National Crime Victimization Survey. Uh, what, uh, Michael said that it, uh, the, the format of asking about criminal victimization inhibits reporting because a lot of people don't think of uh, acquaintance rape as a crime. Uh, Actually, the NCVS was redesigned in, I believe, 1994, precisely in response to those concerns. Uh, so that now they, they, they specifically say, well, now we're going to ask you about sexual violence. And by the way, we want to remind you that sometimes sexual violence and sexual attacks happen between acquaintances. And sometimes we don't think of it as a crime. But you know, if you have been attacked, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, they actually have specifically tinkered with the survey to make it more responsive to these concerns, and they still get that pretty low rate. Now, uh, regarding the Bonnie Fisher study, I think that this is what I was driving at by saying that a lot of these studies, in my view, have the same faulty methodology. I think the really, the, the sort of the elephant in the room is that the questions about so-called incapacitated rape really make no distinction between you know, rape when you're passed out or barely conscious and you're sexually assaulted, in which case I don't think any person of any decency would doubt that this is in fact sexual assault and that the person should be uh, you know, not only expelled from college but hopefully prosecuted and convicted. Uh, and the, these are so, certainly predatory actions. But there, the, the surveys make really no distinction between that and incidents such as the ones I described, in which you're intoxicated, you do something that you wouldn't have, probably wouldn't have done when you were sober. You know, a lot of us have done those things, you know, sexually or not. Uh, and then, you know, when you realize the next day what you have done, and in some cases you see video of it on the internet, you know, suddenly uh, you, you're, you're like, you know, what did I do? And you know, this really was not what I wanted to do. And I think this is where I, I think the culture. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, my. Michael is talking about rape culture. I think there is, at this moment, a sort of culture for um, young women, in many cases, of encouraging them to see rape in incidents that you know maybe should be seen as poor decision making. In many of these cases, the women, uh, when they've had these drunken experiences, they go on to speak to their friends. They go on to speak to a counselor. Uh, and they end up being told that they were raped. I mean, I have a friend who had this experience, by the way, on, uh, on a college campus 20 years ago, this is not even new, where she was told, she, she went to speak to a counselor about this experience that she felt was very ill-advised and she wanted to you know, talk about how to improve her decision-making skills and you know, deal with uh, these the, the situations better. And instead she was told, oh no, you really shouldn't even think about that because you were raped. Now, my friend uh, happens to be the kind of person who you know, doesn't necessarily you know, follow uh, every bit of advice that she gets, who has a pretty strong sense of you know, autonomy and uh, agency and who felt that that was extremely demeaning to her to basically tell her that she's not responsible for something that she did uh, in, in that situation. Uh, but I think that many uh, young people who have little experience, uh, I think that is very tempting. Um, so, you know, I, I think this is the, the real issue that we have to deal with when we discuss whether it's surveys. And, you know, the reason that I wanted to discuss anecdotes is behind those surveys, you know, we don't really know what these answers mean. And I think this uh, is the kind of thing that we really need to look at to understand uh, what, these, uh, what these numbers on the surveys refer to. Um, in terms of uh, comprehensive sex education, uh, a lot of schools right now have mandatory uh, workshops on consent, mandatory workshops on uh, basically uh, healthy sexual communication. Uh, I don't have a problem with um, you know, having a system in place in colleges to help people make healthier decisions sexually, to help with uh, you know, uh, better communication and relationships and so on. I do have a problem when these um, educational programs set up a framework that kind of reflexively blames men. 
where that or when these programs promote the, the, the sort of legalistic requirement of oh well you know everything that you do sexually has to be negotiated and verbally and signed in triplicate so you know that so that's I think it really depends on what kind of education we're talking about. Thank you, so. uh, Kathy. Thank you. Right, we're uh, we're going to the uh, uh, question uh, part of the evening. Uh, you may want to start lining up at the mic over there to ask questions. Uh, the two debaters have been told that if at any time they want to toss a question at the other side, they can exercise that option. Uh, Michael, Kathy, at this stage, uh, do you want to ask a question at the other side, or do you want to bide your time? Okay, uh, but uh, Kathy, you want to? You know? Okay, you're both good, but uh, remember, uh, guys, uh, to make sure that you're uh, holding the mic not far from your mouths. Uh, uh, the uh, only, of course, give the usual. Uh, give the I'm giving the usual instruction to the questioners. Please uh, ask your question, pose it as a question, uh, and uh, wait for the answer to the question. Uh, so, uh, first question. Please uh, take it away. Hi, this question is for Michael. Um, during your intro, you said that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you said something along the lines of uh, society does not want to believe women. Somehow, to me, this seems like it, it suggests that society can countenance the fact that women are being assaulted and that they're fine with having rapists at large. I'm wondering like, what arguments you can proffer to defend that, that supposition, yeah, seeing as well. how Seeing as how um, it also seems to be the case that um, on, on college campuses, administrations are ready and willing to defenestrate uh, due process rights for the accused. Did you, uh, you want to summarize the question as you understand it and then address it? Uh, the, the, question, the question is, uh, as I understand it, um, before, the, before the part about due process going out the window, um, the, the part is that I, I argue that rape culture is a culture in which women are not, to be, not believed, right? That's what I argued. And you are asking me... You said explicitly during the, belief, during the beginning that... Yes. You said explicitly during the, be the beginning that, the cult, that society does not want to know. Right. Those were your exact words, if I'm right. not mistaken. Right. Because, and, and I said society doesn't want to know because we have no nationally representative survey of all college students to get the kind of, so we are relying on campus numbers, which all come about the same, and all of these large scale surveys, which also come, come, at, come out roughly the same. So, so my, my argument was, why don't we want to know? Why don't we want to know the answer to this? Um, there is no, is there no political will to know the, the, to get the right data? And my argument is we don't want to know because the data would say, would tell us that there is a high prevalence of rape on college campuses. And most administrations do not want to spoil their brand by finding out that, you know, by having to tell people who are applying to their elite colleges, oh, by the way, about 25% of, uh, of, of the female students here will be sexually assaulted, and about 10% of the men. Okay. Um, Kathy, you want to comment? Uh, please pick up the mic if you do. Uh, right, well, I, I think that, uh, Really, the, the part of this whole uh, the, this point that was just made really goes to one of my problems with uh, the whole sort of rape culture paradigm, which is this uh, statement that uh, you know rape culture is a culture in which women are not believed uh, about uh, specifically about rape. First of all, do we have any evidence that male victims are believed any more readily than female ones? I mean, I would say that if anything, it's the reverse. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of uh, the, there's a lot of data actually showing that male victims, I think, are even less likely than women to report sexual abuse and uh, even less likely to be believed. Uh, I mean, until very recently, uh, the uh, sexual abuse of an underage male by an adult female was not even a crime. And you know, now 
it's sort of, it's changed, and we have all these situations where, you know, female teacher is going to jail for sexually abusing uh, boys who in some cases are as young as, you know, 11 or 12. Uh, and there's still, in many areas, I think there's a mentality of, uh, well, you know, he just got lucky because, you know, <laughs> he had sex with a teacher. Uh, so I think that there's, you know, the, I think there's certainly a history of uh, the, have there been unhealthy attitudes uh, in the area of uh, sex and sexual assault. Sure, I would say that they don't necessarily victimize only women uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, who is affected, you know, which victims are affected by these attitudes. But I would also question the, this premise that, you know, believing people who come forward with a specific allegation is somehow a sort of moral obligation in terms of having a uh, kind of a non-rape culture, so to speak. I mean, the presumption of innocence is a uh, cornerstone of our justice system. And I think, you know, we can debate to what extent do, you, do we owe somebody the presumption of innocence in the court of public opinion. It's certainly not the same thing as, uh, as in a court of law, but even so, I think we've, uh, we've certainly, in terms of the culture in general, we've moved toward the belief that, you know, there should be a presumption of innocence in the court of public opinion, which is why you know, the media uh, for the past 40 years or so uh, will refer to somebody as an alleged you know, perpetrator rather than uh, you know, a perpetrator. Uh, so I think th th this notion that somehow in the area of rape, uh, there should be an exception to this and that uh, you know, a, uh, you know, the proper cultural attitude is one of belief uh, for anyone coming forward with an accusation of rape uh, really seems to me very dangerous. And this is what I was, this is the point I was driving at when I said that the rhetoric of rape culture really is, in my view, hostile to the presumption of innocence. Do you want to make a comment, Michael? I think you prove that there's a rape culture when you also say that boys aren't being believed. Neither is being believed. So there's a rape culture on college campuses that creates an unsafe environment for both female and male students. I'll go with that. Uh, next question. Uh, this one is for Professor Kimmel. You, uh, for, your, uh, for your position, you said that something like 90% of uh, victims do not report the, the, the rape. Yeah. Um, so rape has a specific legal definition, uh -huh. and so does harassment as a, as a you know, subcategory. Uh -huh. And part of that is both rape and harassment have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So when you say that 90% of victims don't report it, you're also presuming that all of those were actual crimes proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, 100% of those, 90%, let me finish, 90% of those, 100% um, of those could be adjudicated and there could be rape or harassment. It could be zero, it could be something in the middle, but to just presuppose that because 90% of them uh, don't speak up, that there is actually rape, is, um, well, it's not uh, logically consistent. I think that's a good that's a question. You want to address it, please? No. Yeah, uh, it, I, I, I don't disagree at all. Uh, look, I'm making no assumptions about guilt or innocence. I'm saying that 90% of women who, ha who, who made the legal definition according to for forced or unwanted sex, et cetera, do not report it. Now, would that rise to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt? I have no idea. Neither do you. Neither does anyone. That's fine. But my point is that most women who, who have experienced something that meets this legal definition do not report it. Now, that's not simply, the, the law is a blunt instrument, and it's a disaggregating instrument. It looks at each individual case on its own individual merits. I have no problem with that. That's simply what it is. But what I'm suggesting is that there's also a context in which women, for a long time, would say, you know, this happened to me, and their female friends would say, you could ruin his life. You don't want to get him in trouble and they wouldn't report it. Now, some women were, are likely to say that, and other women are saying, I will go with you. We are going to take this to the Title IX coordinator. This is wrong. So there has been a, some, a, a significant change on college campuses, and the, and the rates of reporting 
have actually gone up several percent over the past five or six years. Now, you may say that this is a problem. I say, I, I look at it as good news. Women are recognizing what happened to them. They believe that they're entitled to be believed and that they believe that they're entitled to have it adjudicated. What about a comment? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, and I did want to comment on this before, uh, when we talk about 90% uh, of women uh, who, Michael said, uh, who had experiences that meet the legal definition of rape, I don't know that we know that because, again, a lot of those numbers are based on surveys that include uh, so-called incapacitated rape, which basically means you know, rape when you are too drunk to consent. And a lot of those surveys, as I said, are phrased in such a way that we really have no idea whether the respondent was actually incapacitated or had their judgment clouded by alcohol to the point where they did something that they wouldn't have done when sober. So I think we really have no idea what the, what the real rate of non-reporting in those studies is if we're talking about you know, actual uh, sexual assault that meets the legal definition. Uh, if you look at the numbers, if you look at the, the reasons that women, and a lot of those are women-only surveys, so we're talking about, uh, I'm mentioning women, uh, that they give for not reporting, it's not primarily because they say that they won't be believed. I believe the number one reason is that they don't believe this was such a big deal. I mean, that is the number one reason. I didn't think it was that serious. Uh, and, you know, th where I, I felt that it was a private matter. Uh, so, you know, the, the real issue, obviously for some people, it is that they're afraid of not being believed. They may be afraid of retaliation. They may be afraid of, you know, uh, ruining their own reputation or uh, you know, ruining the guy's life. For many people, it's that they really do not regard this as a criminal act. In terms of, yes, there, there are more women coming forward and you know, having support from other women. In some cases, that's a positive thing. In some cases, it may be one of the situations I mentioned where you have an experience where you, you did something when you were drunk, you're not feeling so great about it, you talk to your friends about it, and the advice that you get is, oh, this is actually not your fault, you were raped. And you know you you don't uh, you, you don't have to take responsibility for this. Instead, you go to the Title IX office and uh, report it as a rape. I mean, this is I, I'm not just using this as a hypothetical. This has happened in specific known cases in which you know the, the uh, complainants did not even think of reporting uh, what happened and didn't think of it as a sexual assault until they spoke either to their friends or to a counselor or to somebody from the Title IX office. I don't think this is always a good thing. Sometimes these cases uh, are very obvious when you look at the facts, very obvious uh, sort of travesties of justice. These are the kangaroo court cases that we've heard about. So, you know, I, I think that in some cases, certainly there has been a positive change in awareness. I don't think it's a, it's a kind of unqualified positive development. So, uh, next question. For the people on the panel. If um, right now we're talking about rape on college campus, if we change the narrative for one second and interject prison, how would that change um, either one of you point of view on that? Uh, it, could you clarify the question, prison? Uh, the, yes, if we're, t we're taking out college campuses oh, prison. and we're oh, adding in prisons prison. to the scenario, we're still rape. You want to talk about rape in prison. Uh, Kathy, you want to address uh, yeah, that? Yeah, this is actually something that I've written about. Uh, I actually do think that this is a vastly underreported issue, and uh, you know, this is uh, an extremely violent environment where very often uh, you know, people are actually coerced, uh, even if there's no sort of overt physical force. There's coercion by threat of force. Uh, there's a tradition of not taking it very seriously. I mean, you know, we, we've all decided a while back that rape jokes, uh, sort of demeaning women's experience of rape are unacceptable, but there, there's still quite recently, there have been many instances of people making jokes about, you know, someone who's about to go to prison, about, you know, don't bend over to pick up the soap, et cetera, et cetera. You know, th that's uh, kind of regarded as acceptable cultural currency, really. So, uh, so I think this is one area where I think we, uh, I, I think it really does 
does need to be taken more seriously. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think uh, that definitely changes the equation in many ways. Rick, and Prison, you want to address it? Sure. There are many arenas in which there's a significant rape culture. Um, rape is used as a way that some groups dominate other groups. This is true in, in war. Uh, ra rape has become a weapon of war. It, it is true in prisons. Um, it is an evidence of inequality. And that inequality is exactly what I am talking about on college campuses. Men run the parties, they serve the alcohol, they fill the drinks, they decide who gets into the party and who doesn't get into the party. You, it is an I irony that I have been working on for many years that probably the most gender equal place I can think of in the United States is the American college classroom by day and at night it's a completely different arena. And here's how you, anthropologist again, sorry, um, would tell you that you can read power relationships by how people dress, who dresses up for whom. By day, walk into any college classroom, everybody's gonna be dressed the same. T-shirts, sweatshirts, jeans, sweatpants, flip-flops, running shoes, everybody's dressed the same. At night, the guys are still dressed exactly the same. The women are wearing crop tops, heels, short skirts, and makeup. You can read power by who dresses up for whom. By day, it's a gender equal world. At night, it is not at all equal, structurally and interpersonally. Rape happens in, in, stru in structures and in institutions characterized by inequality, period, full stop. Military, prison, sports team initiations, and also, of course, the American college campus. Uh, let me, uh, let me uh, exercise moderator's prerogative to ask you a question. Uh, Michael, uh, twofold question. Uh, do you think that uh, the rape culture was very prevalent in the 60s and 70s? Uh, is, is it a new phenomenon on the college campus? And then uh, second, do you find, will you teach at Stony Brook, that there is indeed the kind of rape culture that you speak of? 25% of women have been raped where you teach? Well, um, I've been part of the online college uh, social life survey. We've, we've surveyed 25,000 students. Stony Brook was one of the sites um, uh, of that. It was initiated by uh, Paula England when, she was, um, when uh, she was at Stanford and Elizabeth Armstrong at University of Michigan and myself. Um, we have 25,000 students. So the answer to that question is by percentage, yes. The answer to the but yes, yes, about about 20 percent of, of Stony Brook women have reported sexual have have met the criterion, whether they label it or not. So that's that answers the the, the, the second part of your question. The first part was, uh, is this a new phenomenon? Oh, is this new? Was it true, when you and I were going to college, um, where all I was where, where those women. I don't. I you know to be perfectly honest. This is the thing that I, I tried to wrestle with when I, when I wrote Guyland some years ago, was the fact that it didn't seem all that new, much of the behavior, and, then, and yet it feels more pervasive now, more intense, and, for, and far more, more consistent. I do think that this is, a, this is something that has been going on for a very, very long time, and that it took a long time for women to say, you know what? This isn't okay. Just as women started to say, starting in the 1980s and then culminating, of course, in that great historical moment in 1991 when Anita Hill t testified about what happened to her, was women are starting to speak about this and for once, finally, they're being believed. The Me Too moment, I, I will say this, it, I categorically is, can, is a sea change because for the first time, women are being believed, and I think this is really revolutionary. So, so you think the rape culture is probably? Better? I think it when, absolutely. When you were, when, of course, when, when you were in college, the I, level of casual racism, homophobia, and sexism when I was in college was astonishing. And what? And and frankly, it was sort of like segregated water fountains in the South. It was normal. We just thought it was normal. That's sort of way the way things were. And it took a whole bunch of women. In, from, you know, in the 1960s and 70s to say, this is not normal. This is inequality, and we won't put up with it. You know, and even, and true confession, my, you know, I was the student leader activist in my, on my campus, and my girlfriend typed my speeches. That seemed normal to us. That is, but now it seems that, it, so women have come forward to speak about these things and say, this is not normal. Well, she, she typed your speeches, but you didn't rape her, but I assume, yeah. What I'm saying is, yeah, yeah, yeah. what I'm saying is the inequality yeah. felt normal. 
my, my, yeah, sure, no, I understand. Okay, um, do you have a comment? Do you have a yeah, comment actually, about my? Yeah, yeah I, I actually do have a quick comment. Okay, first of all, I mean, I would really sort of question the uh, idea that, uh, you know, the fact that our cultural norms right now is that women dress up, you know, in a way that men don't. Does that necessarily, you know, is that necessarily a measure of inequality favoring men? I mean, I don't know. I mean, there were times in history when men had extremely elaborate fashions, in, in no less so than women. Uh, they weren't exactly times of more equality necessarily. Uh, I think many women would, many college women who dress up that way would seriously question the notion that, you know, they're necessarily dressing up to please men or that, you know, this is some measure of being subservient. Uh, I mean, you know, I certainly wouldn't mind seeing, you know, seeing more kind of male dressing up, but, you know, that's, uh, you know, <laughs> my personal view. Uh, but I, I really question whether this, uh, it's a little too simplistic to uh, describe that as an equality. And the other thing, the, the other point that I want to make, because uh, Michael sort of comes back to this gender analysis where sexual assault is a function of, uh, again, of male dominance. If it is a function of male dominance, uh, what do we do, again, with the fact that when we survey both sexes, on these issues. And now Michael said 25% of women, 10% of men. I've seen surveys where it's a lot closer than that. We're probably, you know, about 40% of those um, uh, reporting sexual assault in the past year um, are males. So, you know, is it is, is the rape culture an issue of uh, male dominance, which is the, the typical analysis, or you know, if it's an almost gender neutral issue? What sense do we really make of that? And is it really rape culture, or is it possibly a sexual culture that, uh, you know, th that has norms that some of us may not approve of? I mean, there's a lot of reckless sex. There's a lot of drunk sex. Uh, there's, you know, sex that uh, possibly involves sort of aggressive physical initiation of sex that doesn't again, necessarily translate into actual force or actual violation. Uh, I think that, again, we're conflating a lot of categories here, and I think this is really one of the stumbling blocks to me. You know, if, if, this is, if the rape culture is an expression of uh, male dominance, you know, what do we do with the fact that there are so many male victims, apparently? If we, if we use these definitions, which you know, I personally don't, but if we use those definitions, we end up with a lot of male victims. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, next question, please. Hi. So I guess I have one question for each of you. Um, so for the professor, I was just curious. Uh, you said many times that we should believe uh, the victims. Um, and I'm sure most sane people will agree that it is extraordinarily difficult to actually prove rape, for instance, beyond a distinction uh, with rough sex. Uh, so. How would you, wouldn't you feel that it's slightly hypocritical to essentially place the burden of proof on the defendant, uh, i.e. believe the victim instead of burden of proof on the plaintiff, which is the core of criminal justice in this country? Uh, and for Kathy. Uh, well, uh, you can ask the question of Kathy. I'll let Michael respond and then Kathy. Okay, okay, cool. But hold your question, yeah. Go on, Michael. Uh, look, very few prosecutors are going to take a rape case when it's he, shed, he said, she said, because they're unwinnable. Pe prosecutors get promoted on the percentage of, win, of wins. So they're not going to take these cases. So I, 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 there's, it's another disincentive to reporting. If you're, if you're saying to me that we should put the burden of proof on the plaintiff to prove it, that's the burden of proof is put on the state to prove it, not the, in, not the victim. The state has to prove a case, which is why it's so difficult to prove these cases, um, and why so many, so few women come forward. Uh, I, I, I think it's a pretty easy, pretty easy answer. Uh, do you want to comment, Kathy, or do you want to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think I sort of commented on this before. I mean, I agree that the burden of proof is technically on the state in uh, in uh, criminal justice uh, cases. Uh, there is a complicated issue of how do we decide these cases in the court of public opinion. You know, do we label somebody a rapist, a sex offender, on the basis of an accusation? Uh, 
I mean, I think this is a very, very difficult issue to wrestle with, and we can't resolve it simply by saying, believe the victims. Uh, I mean, there, there's been a lot of debate about what is the rate of false accusations, uh, and I've written about this issue, other people have written about this issue. Uh, one number that gets cited a lot is uh, only 2% of rape accusations are false, others have said it's 8%. The problem is, when we talk about studies of false accusations, we only know about cases that are definitively proven to be false. That doesn't necessarily mean that all the others are true. I mean, in the same studies, a lot of cases remain unresolved, so we actually have no idea what the rate of false accusations is. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be false accusations in the sense of someone deliberately lying. I mean, in a lot of these studies, they will say that you know there's a certain percentage of cases where the accuser believes that you know she has been raped, uh, especially cases involving, again, intoxication, but the facts really do not support the, uh, the, the, the accusation of rape. Uh, so I, I think that this notion that false or wrongful accusations, because they're not necessarily false in the sense of, again, being a deliberate lie, but to say that wrongful accusations are so rare that we can just dispense with that risk of you know, wrongly accusing someone and we can decide to believe because you know, we know that the, supposedly that the overwhelming majority of accusations are true, uh, I think that's a very, very dangerous mindset. And I mean, I could give you examples of what I think are really troubling uh, examples of a sort of accusation equals guilt mentality uh, when it comes to rape accusations. Um, I mean, including that there was, uh, uh, there was a story in the news a couple of years ago involving uh, James Dean, who's an, uh, an adult film star who was accused, uh, and there, there were very complicated accusations from several women, some of which were later retracted. But the thing that I found really interesting was there was one uh, woman who was a friend of his who uh, basically said, yeah, well, I sort of, I personally know that one of those, the, the initial accusation is false, she said. Uh, I happen to know them both, and I happen to know that this is a false accusation. And she said this, by the way, in a private message that later became public. And she said, but I'm not going to say that publicly because I really believe that we should support victims and I really don't want to add to a climate in which victims are not believed. And this was someone who said that she personally had knowledge of you know, the accusation being false. I think that is actually kind of terrifying you know, as somebody who believes in the presumption of innocence. I think that this is not only bad for men because this is again often framed in terms of, you know, the the, uh, the danger to men from false accusations. I think undermining the presumption of innocence is going to backfire on everyone, including women. And the example that I always cite in well, this context is that uh, all the example uh, yeah. you gave an example. All right. uh, there's, a, there's a question for. Yeah, uh, for I had a question. Yeah, sorry. For, for uh, Kathy. So, so if you'll forgive my pointedness, um, I come from a mathematics background. So statements. Uh, I mean, you've made a lot of claims and argued your points ideologically, but I was wondering if you could actually offer uh, aggregate statistics to substantiate the claims that you're making. Me? Yeah. That's, that's to Kathy. Which, yes. which uh, claim specifically? All of them. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, what, what uh, I mean, I gave you, uh, I don't know that I made that many claims that were centered on statistics. I mean, well, I. Well, I mean, but respectfully, those are the only claims that p possess any merit. If you don't have any statistics to actually substantiate your arguments, they, I don't think that they would hold any water. Well, uh, 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 can you give me like an example of one statistic that you would like to? Uh... Well, I mean, you, you, you've presented like a good array of ideological arguments, but I'm saying that if like you've presented several anecdotal instances as to where. All right. Well, you know, I can tell you, for instance, that a lot, as I said, the the studies on uh, on in, on uh, campus rape often rely on a uh, survey question that doesn't distinguish between incapacitated rape and uh, basically drunken sex that is later regretted. I don't have any statistics because nobody has actually broken down those, those, uh, the, those uh, studies. So, you know, that, the statistics 
actually don't exist. And I agree that we should have better studies. I mean, I think that when, for instance, somebody in one of those surveys uh, says that they, had, uh, the, that they had sex when they were too drunk to consent, maybe there should be a follow-up question. What does that mean? You know, were you sexually assaulted when you were unconscious? Did you have you know, sex when you were drunk that you later don't remember? I mean, this is the problem. I think we don't have any statistics in a lot of those areas. I mean, the one statistic that I did give you, which, uh, you know, which I think uh, is important, is that when people are specifically asked in the National Crime Victimization Survey, whether they have been a victim of a sexual assault in the past year, the rate for college women is something like four out of a thousand. So, you know, I'm not, and again, you know, I'm not saying that that necessarily is a measure of the real rate of sexual assault, but I think we don't have any good statistics in, in many of those areas. So I'm not really sure how to okay. answer your question. Yes, okay. uh, I'm a statistician. I, I, there are some really good statistics. I read them earlier. I'll read them again. Uh, the MIT survey, which was the college sexual assault survey, and the online college social life, the one that I uh, helped design, um, they asked about forcible rape. They did not ask about, they did not include the unwanted touching, grabbing, et cetera. The forcible rape was 8.5%. When you add attempted rape and incapacitated, it goes up to between 14 and 26 percent, depending on the survey. So there's three different, three different large-scale surveys of many different campuses. Then the ones that I gave you of the individual campuses, of which there are many, and I urge you, if you are really interested, if you are really interested in methodology, look at the shift study that has been done at Columbia, because it is going to be the state of the art, and many, many campuses are going to be following this. Um, and, uh, and, it was, and it was done precisely because of all of the problems that, are, uh, that emerged after the mattress girl, um, Emily Solkowitz, and the, uh, and the accusations of, uh, of the, the guy who, who she accused of, of assault. So there are great statistics out there, but they're incomplete, and we have no nationally representative. The, the mattress girl was the woman who walked around with a mattress around Columbia. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, Just to clarify, yeah. Keep your mic. Captain. Keep your mic, please. Yeah. Uh, the, next question, please. Hi, I have two questions. Um, nobody really talked about the incidence of rape outside of college versus the incidence of rape within college. Is there quite a difference? And second of all, if there is really a 14 to 26 percent chance that my daughter will be raped in college in two years. Should I keep her out of school? Because that seems like a very dangerous proposition. Um, uh, Kathy, I want to address that and then Michael. Uh, right. Well, the, as I said, the National Crime Victimization Survey uh, shows that there is, in fact, a, in the same age group, uh, there is a lower risk of sexual assault um, on campus than for people of the same age off campus. And certainly we know of very high crime environments uh, in which you know, typically very few people go to college. Uh, you know, the uh, poverty-stricken neighborhoods that have, uh, that have a very uh, high crime rate, uh, they, I would say, almost definitely have a higher rate of uh, sexual assault and rape than college campuses. Uh, but again, I mean, the, these measures, the measures uh, that actually look at uh, the crimes that people report in surveys that deal with criminal activity, they do not show anything close to an 18 to 25 percent of, uh, um, of women being sexually assaulted. So, you know, I, I think that uh, uh, sending your daughter to college is pretty safe, frankly. Um, uh, uh, Michael, yeah. Um, look, of you know, I, until 1975, every single state in America had a marital exemption from, for rape. It wasn't until 1993 that every single state had made marital rape illegal. You still got married, right? It's, you, you know, one, one, is, it, one is aware of risk and one should be. But my feeling is if we take all of the different variables that I laid out, we can identify the places that are at highest risk for a sexual assault. 
There are certain parties during a certain time of year with certain groups of guys with a, with a sense of community support for that. So my feeling is we can address that. That's the culture part. That's not the adjudication of individual cases. That's the changing the culture part to reduce that risk. I, my son is a freshman in college, and I want him to have a terrific experience, complete with really great sex. <laughs> well, but you, but you, but, but, uh, and, but so I want him to be aware of all of this. But a question for you, Michael. You, you are saying, though, to this woman who asked the question, she's sending her naive daughter right now to college, and you are saying that naive daughter, she's just 18, she has one chance in four of getting raped. Well, Is that right? Well, over, Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I am saying, but overall, you, that's, uh, that's what the data show. Overall, now, yeah. Wait, no, no wait. Yeah. However, her, her, right, if she's a fre her freshman year, Highest rate. One chance in two? What? No, 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 no. I'm just oh. saying the highest rate. Oh. Between or freshman orientation and Thanksgiving, over half the rapes take place. Maybe have her go second semester. Um, what, what I'm saying is you have to be aware of all of the variables that produce, that are part of this culture. It is not a simple cross the board 25%. That's what I'm saying. Be, being aware of that. So there, and, and every campus, does, you know, women tell other women how to reduce their individual risk for sexual assault. You go to parties with friends, you never lose eye contact, you taste each other's drinks, you, you always, you follow each other to the bathroom if you have to, you make sure that uh, your friends are safe. But right now there's a one chance in four risk. Okay, I mean, I just want, just, just want. Uh, the, uh, right. the, well, uh, actually I believe that even the, the figures that Michael was citing before don't actually show a one in four risk of being raped. It's uh, a kind of more broadly defined sexual assault, including attempted rape. Uh, and, you know, and again, you know, the, the, the definitions, uh, what I said before, by the way, I kind of want to come back to what I said before, which is that I think it is becoming very difficult to... Uh, to do a reliable survey of rape on college campus because of the way that you know young people are being taught about uh, sexual assault and consent. And I mean, I'm not even sure how people define physical force anymore. I mean, does a uh, kind of physically aggressive but not necessarily coercive, uh, you know, move uh, count as physical force. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's becoming a very, very treacherous water. Uh, uh, next really. question. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Next question. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a, uh, a few short questions I'm hoping we could uh, figure out together that might frame this debate. Um, can I ask you, Professor Kimmel, uh, about how many women's centers would you say are on campuses in, these co in this country? Women's centers? Women's centers? Yeah, across the country. I don't know, there's probably women's centers at most college campuses, if not, you know, I would say, what, 80% or something. Then probably one to 2,000, given that there's one something to 2,000 like campuses. I, I How many know. men's centers are there? What's that? How many men's centers are there? How many men's centers are there? Well, uh, I run the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities at Stony Brook. I, I believe no that idea. was the first men's center in this country. It's not a men's center, it's a, it's a center for research. Right. And, uh, but it's, but there, are, there are centers for, there are some centers for men, but not many. Okay, when I hand, read about- Let's say a handful. When I read about the opening of your center, the article said it was the first one for men. And when I read your website, it actually said it's a center to study toxic masculinity, how it affects, um, how it affects inequality for women. Now, even the one men's center apparently studies how men negatively affect women, not the problems faced by men. That's so, not true. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, toxic masculinity is not a phrase I would use. Okay. Uh, I, I don't. And, so, um, and secondly, uh, that is not, the, our, our mission is to understand masculinities, uh, plural, to understand the different ways in which different groups of men understand masculinity, to talk about the ge to talk about gender relationships, men men women's relationship, men's relationship with other men. Uh, so I, I don't I don't think that that's uh, our mission in the slightest. Are, Here, I, I, here's pose, the question. Pose, pose your question. Here's yeah. the question. Given that there are one to two thousand women's centers across the study, basically none for men. It seems like women's centers is a billion dollar industry at least. Um, we know that since at least 1979, women have outnumbered men in campuses uh, on, in tertiary education. Yeah. Still, there's not one men's center. And we also know that for the last few years, at least, women are 17% more 
of college students than, than men, according to Department of Education, uh, the Federal Department of Education statistics. So, do you think that perhaps rape culture, this notion of rape culture is a, is a notion that your industry is dependent on to get billions of dollars in funding from the federal government? And, okay. and do you think, the second part, let me just finish and I'll be sure, done. Sure, please. And please do you think that, that if a grad student decided, hey, I would like to get funding to write a thesis about how many men are, 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 are victims, or that there's no such thing as campus rape culture, do you think, A, like Laura Kipnis, he, get a, a, he, um, he would get a Title IX complaint against him for, like you said earlier yourself, the very fact that we're having this conversation is, a, is, is asserting rape culture, and B, do you think there's any money out there to fund that statistic, and therefore we're only getting one side of the story? Thank you. Unfortunately, okay, um, that, that, that's gonna have to be the last question, uh, because we're running out of time. Oh, Michael, uh, to answer. Oh, please, from your mouth to, to the funders' ears, we have, there's no funding at all for this. There's no political will for this. If only we, this was a billion dollar industry, we'd be so happy. Um, but look, this is, this, is a, this is a serious question. Um, you talk about the percentage of women and the percentage of men, that women constitute 60% of all college students, everybody knows this, women, women get most of the honors there, 75% of all high school valedictorians are women, that there's a big boy crisis. Let me just tell you, there are more people going to college than ever before. It's not that men's, men are going like this and women are going like this. That's how you think about it. The reality is both women and men's rates of college, of college attendance are increasing. The rate of change among women is greater than the rate of change among men. But it is in no way that men are disappearing. More people are going to college every single year, period. So that is a false, a, a false framing. Um, secondly, I just want I, I want to say our center is part of a gender studies conversation that is part of you know just as if I were to have establish a, a a center for whiteness studies to understand what how white people might think about different ways of being white. Obviously, whitenesses like masculinities, and of course we are going to be in conversation with all of those people who've been talking about race for all of these years. Thank you, Michael. We've run out of time. Uh, and uh, I, I, this, do, you, uh, do you have a burning need for comment? Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, no, no, pun. no burning need. Okay, Michael, uh, Michael, uh, you, uh, uh, we, you are going to do your summation, uh, and uh, that's five minutes, followed by Kathy, and uh, then we're going to take it to the final vote. So listen closely to the summations and think about how to vote. Take it away, Michael. Okay. I'll, I think I'll just sit here okay. if that's all right. You can, you, can, you, you can stand, I'll, I'll, I'll sit here. Go ahead, yes. Okay, um, I, I, my summation is gonna be fairly simple. Um, first, I think that we are, um, we are in a moment that is, uh, as I said before, the Me Too moment is, uh, I think, revolutionary. Um, and I think it's revolutionary, and it's, it's, a, it's a new way of thinking. It is what I think of as a Confederate monuments moment. One minute, the Confederate monuments throughout the South were just those quaint Southerners who didn't realize that they lost the war and they were memorializing their, the lost cause of the old South, the lost tradition, et cetera. And then two years ago, suddenly we realized, oh my God, those people loved slavery. They were defending slavery. That's not right. That was a moment when we, when we took off a certain lens, put on other ones and said, that's not normal. We are living in, the, in, in a culture right now that is undergoing what used to be normal in the workplace is no longer normal. I grew up thinking my workplace was gonna look like Don Draper's. My father's workplace did look like Don Draper's, you know, which meant all the men had the offices with the windows and all the secretaries were gathered in the center and sexual access to those women was a perk. That is no longer acceptable. We are living in a, in a time of tremendous change. And I would say this to the people in this room, that, we are, we, that this is changing as we speak, in real time. So many of, uh, many of the, the surveys about, about sexual assault in, in the Me Too era, uh, I'm sorry, about sexual harassment in the Me Too era, are talking a lot about how age is a factor in understanding this. Because like baby boomers and older, we grew up thinking that this was gonna be our workplace. It's not normal. What we thought was normal is no longer. I think, I think that this is equally true on college campuses. What we thought was normal, in answer to you, is no longer normal. Um, 
And sec secondly, I, have to, I want to say I have a great idea if you really want to think, think this through with me. I'm arguing that rape culture is not necessarily ideological. It is structural. It is in the way we organize our institutions. When sororities are prohibited from serving alcohol at parties and only fraternities can do so, they're the ones that have a party. I have a challenge for any college and university in this country. For two years, I want only the sororities to serve alcohol at parties. And they will be the ones at the door, and they will be the ones to decide if you're a gentleman enough to get in. I know some guys will slide, slide their way through, but basically, if she gets so drunk that she's incapacitated, she goes upstairs to her room, and she closes the door. My feeling is, I don't know, I'm a social scientist, I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is sexual assault rates might go down. Worth a try, don't you think? Um, finally, I wanna say, um, I, I, would, I, I, can't, I can't imagine that we would have an argument that there is not an adversarial sexual culture between women and men, because we talk about it all the time. So I think that we have to deal with, with that. I think that men have a major role to play in this, and I think that the role is positive, because I think that what we're looking for is actually better relationships, and yes, in fact, better sex. Um, ending rape culture means that both partners end up showing up more, more consciously and more, and, more, and, more, and, and more present. So I have, men have a major role to play, and so I have an idea about how we might go about this. I'm going to show you something now. Um, the men, do you know what this is? Anybody know? What, what is it? It looks like the piece that goes in the Bingo! Yes, the piece that goes in the urinal, exactly. It's, I, I, and most people call it the urinal thing. Don't worry, this is a new one. Um, <laughs> this is called, it has a technical plumbing supply name. It is called a splash guard. And it goes in urinals. And when a group of men on a particular college campus decided they wanted to do something about rape culture, they put these in all of the urinals on campus. And if you used it as directed, you would see you hold the power to stop rape in your hand. And I would say to you tonight, you hold the power to stop rape culture in your head. Thank you, Michael. Do you want to take the podium? Want, I'll okay. stay here. Okay. Yeah, I'll stay here. Five minutes for Kathy. Final right. summation. So yeah, I just want to quickly say, first of all, the Me Too moment. I think a lot of people, including many women, uh, have certain misgivings about it. I think they believe that it's great that we were taking down powerful sexual predators who uh, take advantage of their position to sexually abuse. They're not particularly happy about a conversation that places on men uh, all of the blame for sexual miscommunications and sexual misunderstandings. Uh, we're redefining sexual relations uh, in such a way that, again, you know, all the problems are, um, are seen as a result of uh, male malfeasance. Uh, as far as um, uh, Michael's uh, last comment goes with the splash guard, I, I remember that bit from his book, Guyland, and I was actually wondering when I read that, how would people feel if, for instance, somebody decided to put signs on mirrors in a Muslim center on campus saying, you're looking at somebody who can stop terrorism. I think this is, you know, when we have this kind of collective blame, when we're basically telling every man that he's a potential rapist, and especially when we're looking at situations, many of which really do revolve around misunderstandings and miscommunications. Uh, I think this is extremely counterproductive. I think this is uh, really not the way to go. This, I mean, people who, uh, re the, the real rapists are not going to be, the real predators are not going to be stopped by a sign that says, you know, don't be a rapist. Uh, because I think that's actually a very, very bad message about rape. It really sends this message that rape is the result of you know a misunderstanding or a miscommunication? I don't think you know that uh, certainly bad uh, sexual experiences happen due to those. I think when we label that as rape, uh, I think we're actually sort of unwittingly exonerating the rapists. And yes, of course, real rapists and real sexual predators do exist. 
And again, they're not going to be deterred by saying, you know, be a nice person. They're going to be deterred, hopefully, by fear of consequences. As far as the sorority serving alcohol, I believe it's the sorority, isn't it the, the sororities association that makes that choice? So it's, it's up to them. I mean, it's not the patriarchy forcing, uh, forcing this uh, different standard on them. It's the sorority's own decision. So I'm perfectly fine with the sororities you know, choosing to serve alcohol at their parties. I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm, uh, you, know, <laughs> I have, uh, you know, not that I've ever been part of the sorority scene, but, you know, but I have no objection. So I think, again, you know, we need to uh, differentiate the conversation about rape, uh, which is a crime, which is, uh, you know, a very serious crime, from the conversation about s ethical sexual norms and responsible sexual behavior. I think those are different things. Uh, and, you know, we absolutely need to have a conversation about ethical sexual norms and good sexual behavior. And I think one problem uh, that, that is contributing to the situation that we have right now is that a lot of the time we seem to, we've got to a point where we seem to be unable to talk about irresponsible, reckless, you know, hurtful sexual behavior without making it an issue of consent. I mean, yes, consensual sex actually can be irresponsible, reckless, bad, hurtful, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these are, again, these are two different conversations. And lastly, uh, yeah, I think that uh, th there's a real danger when we say that to merely discuss something, to discuss the possibility of false accusations, to discuss the existence of rape culture is uh, itself a part of rape culture because that, it seems to me, endangers not only you know, the presumption of innocence, not only relations between the sexes, it also endangers uh, free and open debate. And that, I think, is a real problem. Okay, well, first of all, thank you to you both, uh, both very energetic, articulate uh, in raising our awareness of these issues. Thank you, Michael, and uh, uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, we are now taking it to a final vote. Uh, the uh, people on live streaming are voting, the people in the audience are voting, uh, and again, uh, this is just a game. This debate was just a sort of intellectual sprint. You may want to read Kathy's articles, Michael's articles. We post uh, in Michael's book uh, about these issues. But uh, certainly, both debaters taught us a lot this evening. Uh, I, I uh, want to take a moment to announce next uh, month's debate. That will be on Monday, April 16th. And uh, in that case, uh, the debate will be about the following proposition. Fractional reserve banking poses a threat to the stability of market economies. Quite a change of pace from this evening. Uh, that will be uh, Professor Mur uh, Robert Murphy opposing George Selgin. Robert Murphy will defend the resolution. Fractional reserve banking poses a threat to the stability of market economies. Uh, on Monday, May 14th, Brian Kaplan, George Mason University economist and author, will defend the resolution, all government support of higher education should be abolished, against Edward Glazer, professor of economics at Harvard University. Uh, Kate, how are we doing on the, on the voting? First of all, uh, both sides won, so to speak. Uh, those who voted yes for the resolution were initially 17%, and that rose one, 17%. 17. So, I'm sorry, 17%. I should have said because let's not confuse it with 70%. Yeah, 17%. And that rose to 25.6%. So you picked up 8.5 points. Michael, congratulations. Uh, those who voted no were at 47%, and that rose to 61%. So you picked up 13.5 points, uh, 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 Kathy. The Tootsie Roll goes to Kathy Young, but certainly both debaters swayed some of the audience. Thank you very much.